I know the girls reached out via texting and calling, so I, I can only assume that by the phones being ignored, knowing how my daughter is not going to ignore calls and texts. In the early hours of Sunday, November 13th, 2022, six students went to sleep in their shared home just near the University of Idaho's main campus. Four of them would never wake up again. Later that morning, at 11.58 a.m., police received a 911 call to report someone found unconscious at the residence of 1122 King Road in Moscow. Ethan Chapin, his girlfriend Jana Knodel, both 20, and their roommates, Kaylee Goncalves and Madison Morgan, both 21, were found stabbed to death early that afternoon. In the months since the murders occurred, the police have been tight-lipped, releasing very little information to the public. Without much to go on, the internet has been a free-for-all for armchair detectives and amateur sleuths to publicly announce their theories, suspects, and general thoughts on the case. This has led to confusion for both the investigators and the people of Moscow. So today, let's separate fact from fiction as we take a look at the Idaho student murders. Moscow, Idaho is a college town, home to nearly 12,000 University of Idaho students. Four of those students were Kaylee and Madison, both seniors, Shana, a junior, and Ethan, a freshman. They all worked hard at school and held down jobs, but Saturday, November 12th was a welcomed night off for fun. Best friends Kaylee and Madison were at a local bar, The Corner Club, from approximately 10 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. On their way home, they stopped at the Grub Wandering Kitchen's food truck, better known as the Grub Truck, at approximately 1.41 a.m., which is supported by video footage streamed by the truck. Jana and her boyfriend Ethan were seen at a frat party at the Sigma Chi house on the university's campus around 8 p.m., but their whereabouts are still not confirmed between the hours of 9 p.m. and 1.45 a.m. Cara Northington, Jana's mother, believed her daughter may have been at a bar that evening, but cannot be certain. Initially, it was believed that all the students were back home by 1.45. However, after learning that Kaylee and Madison received a ride home by a designated student driver service, it is now confirmed by undisclosed digital evidence that they actually returned at 1.56 a.m. Bethany Funk and Dylan Mortensen, the other two roommates of the King Road house, were home by 1 a.m. Phone records show that Kaylee attempted to call her ex-boyfriend Jake between 2.30 a.m. and 3 a.m. There were seven calls in total, some from Kaylee's phone and the others from Maddie's phone, the last at 2.52 a.m. that all went unanswered. Coupled with the coroner's report, this shows that between the hours of 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. on the morning of November 13th, the four roommates were stabbed to death while they slept. In the late morning, the two surviving roommates called a friend, or more than one friend over, total unconfirmed, because they could not wake up one of the victims and were under the assumption that the victim was passed out. At 11.58 a.m., the 911 call was placed from one of the roommates' cell phones. However, the dispatcher spoke with more than one person during the call. Police arrived shortly after and have since had the house cordoned off and a security detail to ensure that no one enters the residence. With the timeline of events, for the most part sorted out, the investigators now have to filter through thousands of tips being called in, interviews to conduct, and evidence to sort through. The Moscow Police Department, with a total of 36 employees, has not seen a homicide case since 2015, in which a gunman killed three people in an isolated incident. The FBI and Idaho State Police are now involved in the investigation, but little is still known. What we do know is that the manner of death is classified as a homicide, and that they were stabbed. The murder weapon was a fixed blade knife that left large puncture wounds. It has not been confirmed whether or not the weapon came from inside the house. However, it has not been found. 
Though the police haven't given much information into the attacks themselves, the families have been more willing to speak with news outlets. In an interview with ABC News, Kaylee's father, Steve Goncalves, stated that the attack was quick, adding that an earlier call would not have saved their lives. He also stated that detectives advised him that the murder weapon was something the killer was proud of and paid a lot of money for, insinuating that the weapon was brought to the attack rather than choosing a random weapon from the home. The coroner described seeing a lot of blood on the walls at the scene and confirmed that the victims endured multiple stab wounds but could not disclose how many. In a December 3rd interview, Stephen and Christy Goncalves spoke out, revealing that the manner of death was not the same for his daughter and Madison, even though they were found together in Maddie's bed. Um, is the police department, our investigators, aware of that video and, and has it helped put together that timeline? All four victims were confirmed to have been stabbed. However, it is now apparent that Kaylee's death was more brutal than the others, or at least unique in some way. Which leads us to the why of this attack. Was Kaylee the target, or perhaps one or more of the four? There was no sign of sexual assault, so perhaps the house itself was the target. The motive in this case isn't clear. The mayor of Moscow, Art Betk, told the New York Times that it was a crime of passion. However, in a later interview with the Idaho Statesman, he advised that it was merely a suggestion, that he had not been given any concrete details about motive, stating that it could be any number of things. The idea of a botched robbery has also been mentioned, though it was reported that there was no forced entry. The house sits on a hill in which the front door is on the first level, where the surviving roommate stayed facing the road, and the back door on the second level that can still be accessed from the ground and fairly hidden from the street, making an optimal entry point. Um, there's a couple things that tell me with common sense, but um, I'm not a professional, so I want to specify that, but they've said the entry point was the slider or the window, it was in the middle floor. So to me, he doesn't have to go upstairs. His entry and exit are available without having to go upstairs or downstairs. Looks like he probably may have not gone downstairs. I, we don't know that for sure, but he obviously went upstairs. So I'm using logic that um, he chose to go up there when he didn't have to. And um, I can kind of tell by my daughter's texts, messages. She didn't call 911. She wasn't uh, saying anything along the lines of like she had heard something or she was in fear, so I'm just putting the, the, the dots together. Um, Since there is no concrete motive, the first logical place to look for suspects in this case would be inside the house, namely the two surviving roommates, Bethany Funk and Dylan Mortensen, who slept on the ground floor. However, police ruled the pair out right away, in addition to the friends that were present during the 911 call. Both Bethany and Dylan deny hearing anything unusual during the commission of the crime. In fact, a prior tenant came forward to explain that while living there, he rarely heard any noise from the second or third levels. It was later discovered that there was another person on the lease that moved out before the start of term and was not present at the time of the murders and not considered a person of interest. The driver from the private campus service that gave Madison and Kaylee a ride was also ruled out as a suspect, as well as Jake, the ex-boyfriend that Kaylee called that night. There was an incident on the university's campus in September of this year in which a group of people and a cyclist got into an altercation, resulting in the cyclist brandishing a folding knife while on the university's bike path. The cyclist involved turned himself in and was charged. He is also not suspected at this time. The owner of the grub truck that Kaylee and Madison visited before returning home that night submitted video footage of the girl's visit. Madison and Kaylee can be seen ordering their food and waiting for approximately 10 minutes. During that time, a man in a grey hoodie talks with another man behind them. He appears to be watching the girls, and at one point, Madison turns and shouts an expletive at him. When the girls get their food and leave the scene, the man then throws up his arms before following them. This footage has led many to speculate the intentions of the man, who was also captured on a new video that has surfaced just this weekend. 
Okay, and in the meantime, we do want to uh, kind of dive a little deeper into this uh, new surveillance video that uh, was obtained by Fox News Digital uh, over the weekend. We want to put this up uh, on the screen for you here. Okay, so take a look at some of this. This is newly disclosed. It was taken early on November the 13th. It appears to show both Kaylee Goncalves and Maddie Mogan walking with a man in downtown Moscow hours before that quadruple stabbing in that rental house on the campus. So the women appear to be wearing the same clothes that both Goncalves and Mogan were seen sporting that same evening on that video that you probably have seen outside of a nearby food truck. The man walking with them is also wearing clothes that look like those on a man seen at the food truck whom police have said is not a suspect. So in the video, uh, a woman asks the group, Maddie, what did you say to Adam? And that is caught on the surveillance. As stated, the police have ruled out the man at the food truck whose identity has not been confirmed, and have also ruled out the Adam the girls discussed in the surveillance video. However, the Goncalves family is still concerned how the police are treating persons of interest. Can you elaborate at all? I don't know. Um, you don't have to give a name, but I mean, is it is it someone that she knew or? I have something to say about that. Uh, I just feel like there's been a couple individuals that were cleared very fast. That may not, maybe she not have been. And yeah. She had the strong alibi. Just really fast. It, just you can like, dismiss. You know, an hour later and we're like, what? And I don't know. I don't know anything about those individuals. I just know right. they were people that, you know, definitely should have been looked at and yeah. I don't know what would prevent you from sharing somebody's alibi. Yeah, I think that's what we're struggling with. So it's like, you know, we know what we know. We've, you know, fought for, for Jack Kaylee's boyfriend and, you know, we still stand that way. So I did just kind of want to clear that up um, while we're talking through this ambiguity that, you know, that's not what we're honing in on here. So. We don't want to make more victims out of innocent people. Exactly. No, definitely don't want to do that. No. You've mentioned before that you um, didn't want to have a funeral right now. There have also been reports, according to Fox Seattle 13, that Kaylee Goncalves may have had a stalker, but could not confirm. Just a week ago, Stephen Goncalves told the news outlet that Kaylee had confided in him that someone was stalking her. But a name has yet to be released and it is unclear if a name was given. Another video of a police officer's body cam shows three young men as they are stopped by the officer and are not suspects. However, in the background of a video, four individuals can be seen running in from the direction of the students' homes. So we've been, and all the online sleuths have been, analyzing this body cam, as I'm sure police have, because you can see houses in the background. Do you see that? I mean, what, what's your take on that aspect? Because people online have said they see the joggers, they ask, why are they running at 3 a.m.? The latest announcement from the police is in regard to a vehicle associated with the case. Through our tips, through our leads, some of the evidence that came in, we start to identify patterns. Police now revealing they're going through 22,000 cars that match the search criteria of the one they're looking for, a 2011 to 2013 white Hyundai Elantra, like this. The car resembling this grainy image they're now investigating, captured on a gas station security camera, taken around 345 the morning of the murders. Employees at that gas station telling ABC News they told investigators the car took this route, heading in the direction of the victim's home, but they don't know where it went once it left the camera's view. Officers believe the occupants of the Elantra they're searching for have information critical to the investigation and are pleading to the public for help. If we get the word out there, hey, maybe your neighbor has one in the garage that they don't drive very often. Maybe. Um, the, there's one that's just not on the registration database, let us know. The police have conducted dozens of interviews and are continuing to sift through thousands of received tips via email, phone, and an FBI link. They have collected over a hundred pieces of evidence and taken over 4,000 crime scene photos. Another interesting piece of information was given by Cara Northington, the mother of Jana, when she claimed that Jana's father had fixed a lock only a week prior to the murders. She told news station that she was certain that a lock was fixed, but that she couldn't be sure as to whether it was the front door or her daughter's individual bedroom lock, as all of the bedrooms had a different code-protected lock. Cara believes that this is a clue that shouldn't be ignored. 
She tells News Source that, I think the killer may have even been friends with them. I think it had to have been somebody close to them to have been able to get away with it like this. The information we've just covered was all that the public had to go on for the last six weeks, and the case seemed to be going nowhere. That was until a shocking revelation was made on Friday, December 29th, that an arrest was made in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, in conjunction with the crime. Washington State University graduate student Brian Koberger was charged with four counts of first-degree murder along with felony burglary. It was, in fact, the white Hyundai Elantra that brought investigators' attention to the 28-year-old. Though, when asked directly, investigators advised that they could not confirm a specific piece of evidence that led them to the suspect. When questioned as to whether or not there were any hits in CODIS, the police director advised that he could not elaborate on any DNA evidence either, nor could he confirm a motive in the crime. He was, however, able to confirm that they did find a Hyundai Elantra, but did not confirm that it was the suspect. It was also stated that the murder weapon has not yet been recovered. After learning that their suspect left Idaho to go back to his home in Pennsylvania, they surveilled him for several days while the DA gathered enough evidence and information to secure the arrest warrant. Koberger is currently in custody in Pennsylvania, awaiting an extradition hearing that is scheduled for January 3rd. He does, however, have the option to return to Idaho voluntarily, which will expedite the process. Should he choose to remain in Pennsylvania, the extradition process can be a long one. He is currently held on no bail and has been issued a public defender. So far, all that is known about Brian Christopher Koberger is that he lived in Pullman, Washington, only 10 miles out from Moscow. Ironically, or perhaps not so ironic, he holds an associate degree from Northampton Community College in Psychology, a bachelor's degree from DeSales University of which the area of study was not disclosed, and a master's degree from Washington State's Criminal Justice Program, where he was also a teacher's assistant for their criminology department. One fellow student told CBS News that Koberger was always looking for a way to fit in and explained things in a complicated manner in order to make sure you knew that he knew it. Police Chief James Fry held a press conference Friday afternoon to announce the arrest and what details could be given. I recognize the frustration with the lack of information that's been released. However, providing any details in this criminal investigation might have tainted the upcoming criminal prosecution or alerted the suspect of our progress. We will continue to provide as much information as we can as the process moves forward. Both the chief and the prosecution's office advised that information was and is still being withheld in order to secure a conviction. Finally, as the chief indicated, this is not the end of this investigation. In fact, this is a new beginning. Y'all now know the name of the person who has been charged with these offenses. Please get that information out there. Please ask the public, anyone who knows about this individual, to come forward, call the tip line, report anything you know about him to help the investigators and eventually our office and the court system understand fully everything there is to know about not only the individual, but what happened and why. Your department and other investigators on the case took a lot of flag for keeping information close to your chest. Are you glad that you did that? And were you worried about tipping the suspect off? I will 100% stand behind the way that we handled this investigation. And this all started from day one with our patrol officers arriving on scene, locking down the scene, um, us calling in the Idaho State Police, us calling in the FBI, and, and keeping information um, that was pertinent to this um, case very, very um, tight. Um, we want to have a situation where when this goes to trial, there is no doubt um, that we've done everything right and, and we've slowed down and we've continued to slow down and we'll continue to do that. Hey, Chief, um, have you guys found the murder weapon or the uh, Hyundai Elantra? Information regarding the warrant and charges will remain sealed until Koberger is brought back to Idaho. The Idaho State Police state that tips on the suspect or crime are still a crucial piece to the investigation, 
over 19,000 of which have already been collected, and they encourage anyone with information to come forward. If you have any information that can assist in the investigation, please call 208-883-7180 or email tipline at ci.mosco.id.us. In a whirlwind investigation like this, it is easy to get lost in the details of the case. But it is important to remember that just weeks ago, four young and vibrant individuals lost their lives in yet another senseless act of violence. Madison May Mogan was born on May 25, 2001 in Eugene, Oregon. When she was just two years old, her parents moved the family back to northern Idaho, where they came from. There, she attended Winton Elementary and then Kurdalin Charter Academy, where she met Madison in the sixth grade. She attended and graduated from Lake City High School before she enrolled in the University of Idaho. At the university, she worked hard on her grades and made the dean's list every semester she was a student there. She also enjoyed the fun side of college, joining the sorority Pi Beta Phi. She and friends liked to go to parties and bars, and all around enjoyed a true college experience. Maddie, as she was called, is described as funny and energetic, dedicated to her schooling, her job, and most importantly, making a good future for herself. She had plans to move to Boise after her graduation in the spring of 2023. She was just 21 years old at the time of her death. Maddie can be seen in her social media photos wearing bright pink cowboy boots that matched her vibrant personality. The boots now sit on her windowsill in crime scene photos, a grim reminder of the beauty that was lost. Kaylee Jade Goncalves was born in Concord, California on June 8, 2001. She was the middle child of five. She was born with an inexplicable scar on her forehead, which her family lovingly teased was where her horns tried growing in. She and her family moved to northern Idaho when she was just one. She attended the same charter school and high school as Maddie before the pair ventured out to university. There, she joined a different sorority than Maddie, Alpha Pi, and wanted to become an elementary school teacher. She is described in her obituary as strong, fair, tough, dedicated, and beautiful. Kaylee was a girly girl that enjoyed fashion and enjoyed buying nice things that she worked hard for, including her new Range Rover. She was social and goofy, but was also serious about her studies, even when working a full-time job. She planned to relocate to Texas after graduation for a job offer. Also described as wild and different, Kaylee's senseless murder at just 21 years old has undoubtedly left a hole, both literally and figuratively, in the middle of her family. Jana Kernodal was born on July 5, 2002 in Kurdalen, Idaho. She grew up in Post Falls, Idaho, where she attended the middle and high school of the same name. She was a gymnast in her youth and moved on to volleyball, soccer, and track in her teens. She held down a job at a chain restaurant until she left for Moscow to attend the University of Idaho, where she became a marketing major. She too was a member of Pi Beta Phi sorority with Madison. She was also an active member on the sales team of Vandal Solutions, a small marketing firm. She took another restaurant job at the Mad Greek Pizza Joint. Jana was an outgoing person that blossomed when she started college, her father fondly remembers. She was always welcoming and friendly, wanting to live life to the fullest. She loved EDM music and going to concerts with friends. Jana is missed deeply by her parents, sister and brother, and her dog, Shoeshine. In one social media photo, she holds her high school graduation cap, adorned with butterflies that reads, For the lives that I will change. So many opportunities were taken away from Jana, and especially from those lives who could have and would have been changed by her for the better. Ethan Chapin was born on October 28, 2002 in Seattle, Washington at 4.43 p.m. 
Shortly after, he was joined by his sister Maze at 4.44 p.m. and brother Hunter at 4.45 p.m. The Chapin family moved to Conway and the triplets attended Conway School. Ethan played soccer, golf, and ran cross-country, but he most enjoyed playing basketball with his brother Hunter. Ethan then attended Mount Vernon High School, but his semester was cut short by the COVID-19 pandemic, so the family moved to Idaho and the triplets worked at Hills Resort. The siblings were all students at the University of Idaho, where Maisie joined the sorority Kappa Alpha Theta, and the brothers joined the Sigma Chi fraternity. Ethan was majoring in recreation, sport, and tourism management, as he enjoyed sports of all kinds and enjoyed being outdoors. Ethan is said to have been more interested in the social aspects of college, while he only tolerated the academics. Ethan's family describe him as having a knack for making people laugh and knowing how to read any situation. His obituary reads, he laughed continuously. He smiled when he woke up and was still smiling when he went to bed. Another tragedy in this case goes beyond just the individuals that were victimized, but the relationships their murders snuffed out. Not only were Madison, Kaylee, Jana, and Ethan roommates, but they were friends. Madison and Kaylee, best friends since they were 12, even wrote a joint letter to their parents to persuade them to attend the same high school together. The pair were always attached to one another. Kaylee's mother even says that when she and Maddie met, she no longer had five kids, but six. Photographs chronicling their decades-long friendship are plastered on their social media pages. The girls were only two weeks apart in age, and in one post, Kaylee wishes Maddie a happy 21st birthday, saying she will join her at the bars in 14 days, 14 minutes, and 14 seconds. No doubt to mark her own upcoming milestone birthday. In this time of grief, Steve Goncalves finds comfort in the knowledge that the girls were always together and died the same way, in the same bed and not alone. Jana and Ethan were close friends before they finally decided on a romantic relationship. Jana's father remarks on how responsible his daughter had become in college and admired her for juggling all that she did while living with a boyfriend for the first time. Ethan's mother Stacy says that once they began dating, Jana was often tagging along on family outings and stayed with the Chapins for two weeks during summer break. Their relationship wasn't quite new, but was still just developing at such a young age. The two seemed to enjoy one another and they were both outgoing and free-spirited. Together or apart, they were both destined to do great things, but will never get the chance to find out how far their love could take them. The murder of the four Idaho students has been making headlines in the past month and is expected to remain there until the killer is brought to justice and the family, friends, and community can move on and process the grief that is felt so deeply by all.